Welcome, everybody. I hope you can all hear me. This is Craig Wenman, our guest of honor today. Hello, Craig. Hello. Uh, some of you may have met Craig before because he's come in as a guest speaker a couple of times. We're very lucky that he's a VFS alum. Uh, and so he feels obligated to come when we invite him, <laughs> which, is, which is often. Um, so Craig has had a wonderful year and it's kind of an extra uh, kind of special opportunity for us to talk to you about your career and what's going on with you because you've just had so much success this year and on such so much of a bigger scale uh, perhaps than before uh, so it really gives us a chance to kind of get you before you're too famous uh, <laughs> and, uh, and ask you lots and lots of questions so first of all um, hello everybody we are using the chat window um, so please feel free to ask questions. There's going to be a proper Q&A section at the end. But if you have questions in passing, uh, do pop them in the chat and we'll try and address them or we'll get back to them later. I hope that's OK. So, Craig, hello. Hello. Do you want to introduce yourself really quickly? Uh, my name's Craig. Uh, I went to VFS in 98, 99. I starved for a few years and now uh, it's going it's going OK. So my favorite story that you sometimes have told um, is the story of how when you met your wife uh, and you told her what you wanted to do and she gave you kind of a deadline. And I would love you to tell that story because it always makes me laugh. Right. Well, I went to Vancouver Film School and learned various things. I was not on the, the great writing campus that they have now. I was doing the directing and producing and, uh, you know, all that stuff. And so I got out of film school and I still didn't quite know how to write a feature film. And so I met a lady and uh, that lady just said, you need to focus on one thing because you're directing like corporate wedding videos, you're doing music videos and you hate it. And, you know, you just want to kill yourself every, every day. So just focus on the one thing you want to do. And so that was screenwriting. And she said, I'll support you for one year. But if at the end of that year, you haven't done anything, you can wash cars at my dad's dealership. <laughs> so a writer just needs a deadline. And that's kind of just how I got into it. You know, if if you want to get it as a job, you got to treat it as a job. So I just started every day from 9 till 9 a.m. till 1 p.m., just writing and writing and writing and getting rejected and making mistakes and saying all the wrong things to all the right people. And basically one year kind of on the dot was when I sold my first script. And then wow. from there, it's, I've been the guy. That's the great. <laughs> it's, it's a great example of needing a deadline, but it's also a great example of, you know, it's a really good idea to marry someone who believes in you. Um, yeah. You got to marry your number one fan or it's just like, because before that I was a musician and the musician without a girlfriend or a boyfriend is just, they call them homeless <laughs> kind of, that's kind of the <laughs> thing. So if you can get you know, Michelangelo had someone who supported his art. So if you can find someone who supports your art and believes in you before other people believe in you, it's a bonus. So I had like one free, free year. That's fantastic. So um, I think I'm allowed to share screen. Oh, no, I can't share screen. If I could share screen, I would be able to show your IMDb listing, which has so many scripts on it. But what I love about you is that that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg. Those are the ones that get made. Um, and and not all of the scripts. So first of all, if you could tell us how many scripts you've actually sold or optioned over the years. I think I'm at 65 and I'm going on the 66 next week. So wow. that's good. But that's only fantastic. 27 of those have been made. And some of those are work for hire kind of things. But uh, yeah, no, it, it's been good. Just because when I first started writing, I was doing maybe one script a month kind of thing, just getting that first draft done, then moving on to the next, getting that draft done, then going back and just kind of checkerboarding it until I had at the end of the year, I had 12 scripts. Um, one of them was okay. You just you need know. one yes. You need one yes. And I got one yes at the end of that year. And uh, nice. it just, we went from there and it didn't get That's made. And then the well, next one, you know, most made. of them, most and the of them next died, one, right? It takes time. Yeah, none of them, none of them got made. Uh, so, yeah, what was the question again? So, I mean, I think <laughs> the question really was really kind of I wanted to prompt you to talk about being prolific because I think a lot of people are quite precious and they're like, I'm going to focus on this one thing and I'm going to re re rewrite the script forever until it's perfect. Um, you kind of took a different route and decided to just write a lot. 
And that's been very yeah, because you learn you learn by writing. You don't learn by reading, you know, all the script books. Those are helpful, and yours, of course, is very helpful. Uh, the Curse of the Dreaded uh, for, what is it? <laughs> the Dreaded Dreaded I have it right here, actually. From Why Film and TV. Oh, I have it right here. You guys, go out and buy this right now. Oh, thank you. Is it backwards on the screen? Probably. <laughs> but um, yeah, I just you know, it's like Hemingway says: the first draft of anything. So you just, no one's going to read that first draft and please never send out that first draft. You're just going to rewrite. You're going to send out your fifth draft. Um, Just put it away for a little bit. And that space that you can, can get away from it a little bit will just help you, especially if you're writing something else. So what I did is I start out, I'd write a horror and then I'd write a comedy and then I'd write a drama and then go back and rewrite the horror and everything I learned from comedy, I would put in the horror and drama. And so I've just been doing that. I've been doing that like every year of my life for the last 20 years. And it just kind of paid off like in the last six months. <laughs> well, you've been making a living for a while. So it's oh, yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. an overnight success. I don't have to do a bartending job or anything like that. <laughs> I can work full time and just sit in my pajamas and, and type away. So it's good. That is really good. Um, So it's been kind of interesting to watch your career as you go through, you know, you started off writing TV movies. So could you you mind talking about that just for a couple of minutes? Like what makes a good TV movie? I don't know about that, but (laughs) um, how I got into TV movies was I actually had just optioned a a horror movie to a producer and uh, he said, it's not going to get made uh, because all the, all the funding always falls through at the last minute. And he said, do you, have you ever thought about writing TV movies? I said, no, no one ever thinks about that. (laughs) When they start (laughs) out, you know, you want to be Scorsese and Paul Schrader, you know, you want to be all these, these, these artists. And, but at the time I'm starving, I'm literally can't afford heat in my house. Uh, I could not even afford toilet paper. So I was like, just like crumpling up old newspapers, the free newspaper that they give away. Uh, Georgia <laughs> Straits, our local one. It's probably why they uh, never review any of my films, but um, <laughs> it was just, they just said, we can have 10,000 bucks in your account in the next 24 hours. We really need this script done. It's already green lit and we don't have a script. And so I was like, oh, okay. So that's how I just got in for a while. I was just living off option money on horrors, thrillers, dramas, and dark comedies. And then they're like, well, let's teach you the structure of the TV movie. And so it was just my first TV movie was just literally just me reading a book saying, okay, this is how many acts there are and everything like that. So it was just, uh, you know, it's just about failing your way up, I guess. <laughs> and and have the, you know, obviously uh, over time, the budgets of the films that have been produced have gone up and Band- you know, Bandit's presumably the biggest budget of the films that you've had made. Yes. <laughs> no, we started, yeah. Our first one, our first horror, we shot it in Death Valley in like July, which becomes the hottest place on the planet. Uh, we shot for $80,000. And that was at a time where there was two companies that wanted the same script. One company had money, but they weren't sure if they could make it in the next year. Whereas the other company said we can shoot it in two months. So I took the cheap one just to get that actual first feature credit. Cause once you have that feature credit, people will see, oh, okay, this, this guy's gone from here to here. And he's gone all the way through the process of just getting beaten down, which is just, it's our job is right. We just, we're professional, just, we take the abuse. And that one credit, then I realized before this comes out, I have about seven months before anyone sees it. So in that time, I could say, I got this coming out, this coming out, and I could just use that as bargaining for other jobs and stuff like that. So that's how I started raising uh, my budget on stuff. That's so it was great. Just, before I'm, they saw it and realized that it maybe. Oh, yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, it's the worst thing. It's not only the worst thing I've worked on, it's like the worst thing I've ever seen. But, <laughs> but it was 80, 80 grand in the desert. We had Eddie Furlong from Terminator was one of the stars. Uh, you know, and it was just, it was a great experience because we were all kind of just stuck, you know, just a mile outside of Barstow, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, so some of the bonds and the friendships that you make on that first, like even the guy who was the second AD is now my writing partner, you know, hey, that's so, so I love that. 
So that experience, like, is that about when you got your first agent or was it after that? No, I had an agent before and I kind of just, I've kind of, it's everything is just kind of a little bit of luck and a little bit of timing. So I have your script ready because there's so many little just weird moments where you just meet one random person and then that leads to another person. Even if it's just a person's assistant, it's just like, that's how you get in. So you just look for those little moments in time. And this was just, I had shot a music video and I was, I was directing it. And uh, the agent had called because the actor hadn't been paid on time. And I said, well, actually, we didn't even pay anyone. We just paid them in drinks and stuff. It's just, you know, <laughs> we're shooting a hip hop video. We, everyone's just getting, you know, drunk and stoned and stuff. And they're like, oh, OK. And then we just started talking from that. That's how I got my first agent. I was like, I do have this script. But it's only because I'd already had the script done and ready and rewritten five times that they're like, oh, OK, well, then let's try that. And so that's how. And then from uh, her, who's she's great. You know, her, Deborah Harry. Uh she got me my first kind of uh, big options and options with like Tom Hanks's company, you know, with Playtone and the guys did white noise and stuff like that. So yeah. it was just, it's just those little fluke things. You just have to be ready when that luck shows up. Wow. That's fantastic. I know her. She's super cool. Oh, um, she's awesome. She's I still talk to her all the time. It was just her birthday, like two days ago. Oh my goodness. That's so funny. Such a small world. So it's, um, and again, some of the people who heard you speak before will have heard about this, but some of the people here have never heard you talk before. And so ink, yeah, we, you know, we talked about, um, ink tips about how you used a website sort of competition -y website, not really a competition, but to get through that first lot without an agent. And someone's asked, Sarah Vance has asked, um, oh, screenplay competition is a good way to break in. So it might be a kind of a good conversation to have about competitions or, or ink tips. Yeah, ink tip was great just because it's a, again, they don't give me any money for, uh, I emailed them. I said, I'm going to give you a shout out today. You better give me some type of free, but they never responded. But <laughs> just an online brokerage. And it's how I got it. I sold like maybe 40 scripts through them. And so you just, you put your log line up, you put your synopsis up, and then you could put your script up and then you see who downloads it at what time and stuff like that. And it's just like, it was like having an agent before I had an agent. So yeah, I actually did that before I had an agent. And so I had, uh, that's true because I had one feature and I had signed a dollar option to, uh, give it to them for a year to take out and see if they could raise money in the UK, in the UK, actually. Uh, but uh, Ink Tip was kind of my way that I really broke in. And I still have stuff up there uh, just because it's great because you can get an a, a agent, a manager, and then you just have, you know, your stuff that's getting out there. The stuff that does better on there is stuff that's under 5 million, 2 millions ideal, small locations. Like even I just watched... Um, Violent Night the other night. Uh, did you, oh, you know this yeah, film? I'm looking forward to that. Where Santa yeah. brings out a sledgehammer? Um, that was like one location. So you could spend your money on all the effects and all the kills, and it was great. Uh, you know, so I would just, if you're going to put something on Ink Tip, I would just have it in the smaller range. You're not going to sell a hundred, well, you're not going to sell a $150 million budget script, anyways. But uh, just get those, just think high concept in a small area. And you'll just sell, not just on Inktip, but anywhere. Mm -hmm. Just like Saw, you know, it's Saw. It's find find your new take on Misery, which was uh, my secret obsession on, on uh, Netflix. You know, it's just finding those small stories with big ideas. So and someone asked in the, in the Q&A, um, you know, it's actually Kerry asked, uh, as thank you for taking time to talk to us as a fellow VFS alumni. I'd love to know where you found out who was buying the TV movie scripts. Was it through connections or festivals? So that kind of a little bit answered by the ink tip thing. And then when you have an agent and a manager, presumably they help you connect. Yeah, yeah, that's well from ink tip. Then I, I got different. I got management and then different agents and, and stuff like that. Um, film screenwriting contests are kind of it's it's a lottery kind of thing um i've never placed in one so i can't speak to too highly of them but i have have had friends who in the nickel fellowship from straight there they're in the top three and then you know they're doing major action films so that contest i know you'll know more cat than i will about them but i know that contest for sure is legit 
but mm-hmm. everyone else is trying to steal your money. So <laughs> just guard your money, guard your money. Because, well, you know, as screenwriters, just even now, we're still desperate people. You know, we don't know where our next job is coming from. So you just got to save up your money and just look out for the people that are trying to take your risk because it's always going to happen for the rest of your career. Hmm. Uh, but Nickel um, Fellowship, and what else would you say, Kat? You Nickel know, is really good. Page is good. Um, yeah. You know, there's there's all kinds. I've actually put a link in the chat window uh, for a website called moviebytes.com. And right, that's my- that's where I did my first, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, they do reviews of competitions. So, you uh, know, yeah, if competition yeah. is, they'll tell you. Uh, yeah. I entered one about. contest, and it was actually through Movie Bites. And, uh, and I got in and I was so excited. So I flew down. It was like my 21st birthday. My mom paid for my ticket and, I, uh, and for my hotel room at the, the best Western on sunset. And it was like the biggest thing. And then, uh, so I got there a day early and then I just got to this bar. It's I'm all alone on my birthday and I put down my ID and then I just hear this voice say, you're from Canada. And I'm like, wait, I know that, that voice from somewhere. And it's David Lee Roth. <laughs> I love Canadians, man. And it's your birthday. All drinks are on me for the entire night. Oh and that was my God. first LA experience. And like <laughs> a drug, I've been trying to go back to that same area to have that same, you know, that same kind of experience. That, but, you know, there's no David Lee Ross around anymore. Well, anyone who knows you knows that you're a huge rock and roll fan. And I know you you name some of your characters after band members, I believe. My son's name is Hendrix. You know, so yeah, all my there'll always be a detective, Jimmy Page or James Page, or <laughs> you know, there'll always be some way to work Led Zeppelin or the doors or, or somewhere. <laughs> I love that. Um, yeah, and you know, not all competitions are created equal, by the way. If you ever want to enter a competition again, Austin Film Festival has a competition and they like genre. So I'm just gonna yeah, say I would just say write genre in, yeah. in general. Um, so whatever you're right, if you just want to write a straight drama, that's fine. If you're writing and directing it, I would do that. But I would also say, find a genre that you like that, and then try to put that drama in that, you know, put that drama in a thriller or a comedy or a Western or, or something like that. Actually, I take Western back, but you know, <laughs> in those kind of main genres, um, you can have all your family. And that's why horror is great. And sci-fi is great. Sci-fi is great because you can say political things. And horror is great because you can also say stuff about your family and stuff like that. So that family drama in a horror is great, especially now because everyone wants that elevated kind of hereditary type horror and stuff like that. So you have a great, it's a great moment in time to do horror on an elevated level, like uh, Haunting of Hill House, or I always say it wrong. Did I say it right that time? So yeah, I just think exactly. house haunting or whatever. And yeah, that Mike Flanagan is just doing family drama, you know, within a vampire or a haunted house or, or something like that. So that's what I, I would say for anyone that's coming in that likes that, do that. Just put drama in that. Love it. Uh, okay. So Philip Clark has a question. He says, I watched Bandit this morning and I loved it. Uh, and being based on a true story, there must have been lots of research needed. How long did it take to finish the first draft? And how many drafts were there in total by the end? Well, that's a good one. Yeah, I had first heard the story when I was like a little kid. I grew up on uh, kind of the east coast of Canada in a, a city called Ottawa, which is our capital, I believe. I don't know. Maybe it's changed. But uh, right. and I heard I actually lived maybe 10 minutes away from the real life bandit. And so in the area I was, it was kind of a rougher area. Um, you know, we had a lot of like little Canadian versions of the projects and stuff like that. And so you would just hear stuff about this guy that would fly in, have drinks at the local bar and then rob them blind in the morning and then get home for dinner. That was always the story. And it always just sounded like one of those urban legends. And then as I got older, I just got on Google. I was like, I wonder what, where did that come from? And then I found a book from there in 2015 uh, so I read the book and bought the rights to the book. And from there, the author introduced me to the real life guy who's out now and hanging out. He keeps texting. He's texting me right now. Are you on your, you on your interview? <laughs> um, so then I just met, I just, uh, I called him and I said, um, I want to make a movie about your life. I think it would be, uh, I think it's crazy, but I'd like to do it like, as like a dramedy, like a catch me if you can, like, you know, no one got hurt. 
you know, you were married at the time as you had broken out of jail, <laughs> you know, you'd had a kid as you're on the run. I think it'd be hilarious. It's okay if I make this movie. And he just, he just, the first thing he ever said to me was, could better make, make this movie. I earned it. And I was like, <laughs> okay, we got to meet, we got to hang out. We got to have a drink. So then we just went to Chicago in 2016 or so, somewhere around then. And then we just, uh, we just shared Airbnb and then we just went around and case banks for, uh, <laughs> you know, five days. And then at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, let's do this movie. It'd be hilarious. I think you're crazy. Like I am. And so, yeah, so now we keep in touch. He was at the premiere. He's in the movie, the real life detectives in the movie. And they're both friends in real life. They came down together. Uh, they were in the same hotel. And so like at the premiere, it was just me, the detective and, and Gilbert just hanging out on sunset strip. We're the last guys at the party. Yeah. Of course you were. That's hilarious. I mean, that's like the perfect way of making a true story. Most yeah. You get that kind of access, but you could have just lucked it. out. And so like, so from first draft, um, I took it out. Everyone passed. Every single person passed. I think we took it out to 25 people, 25 production companies, every production company you've heard of. And everyone passed. So no one wants to see a Canadian story. No one wants to see a story set in Canada. No one wants to see a story uh, specifically with Canadian money, like colorful money. It has to be American money. That's what sells overseas. So everyone passed. And again, it was just a moment of luck that my agent at the time, and still my agent now, knew this director who was also Canadian and looking for a story that it played like a United States story, but it was set in Canada. And so he sent it to Alan Unger, who's an amazing director and a good friend of mine. And he's like, yeah, this is dope, man. And uh, that's, how he, that's how he speaks. I know I have a weird voice as well, but his is really low with dope, dope. Um, he's like cursing me on the other end. And then, so then he actually took it out. He goes, because uh, he had done this fan film for Uncharted, which is a big video game. Oh, which was a big blockbuster that came out uh, after he did his short film based on the video game with Nathan Fillion. And he goes, I got a bit of heat on me right now. I can get this out here. So then we just went in as a team from there with me owning the book rights, the life rights, and then him attached as a director. And that's how we got a production company, also a Canadian production company attached. And then it just kind of went from there. Wow. So yeah, so yeah. as your question on drafts, I'd say 18. Wow. Yeah. That's great. And you were getting notes from the production company from anybody else? Yeah, well, we'd have notes. And then because originally we were going to shoot it in Canada, but then COVID hit. So we did, we got notes from like the Harold Greenberg Fund and, and stuff like that. And they were actually, they gave us some money to develop it, which is great. They were kind of the only Canadians actually that got behind us. Uh, and then COVID hit and uh, we had a little bit of money. And then we just picked up this other production company in the States called Yale Productions. And they said, just bring it down to Southern Georgia. Uh, we can make it look like, uh, 1985 Canada and we were like there's no way you can make because we're like right on the Florida Georgia line you know there's alligators in every body of water coming up and, and stuff like that so we were fish out of water when we went down there but then we started to see a, oh this corner looks like Ottawa this looks like Vancouver this could be Calgary Winnipeg this could be Edmonton and so we just did it piece by piece and I think we had uh, over 100 setups in 20 days and uh, like different uh, locations. So it was a tough one, but uh, it pulled it off. It was because of the director. Uh, Alan's like very, I'm a little more loose and and uh, he's a little more ground of, we do this, 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 this. He's a planner. So it's because of him and our production uh, designer Burns and our and our costume people, Andy Simon, was really great. And uh, we, had a, we had an AD that was from the area. So you could kind of, you know, get people going in and speak to them the way that they need to be spoken in that area, which is very, it was just very like, do this, do this now, now, now. So it was like, it was a rush as I've never seen films made like that before, but it worked out. Wow. I had no idea it had been made that I assumed it had been made across Canada. No, <laughs> no, there's only one Canadian location. It's just our parliament buildings. We went back for one day in Ottawa and just did like a connecting shot to a truck that we shot down in Georgia. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. So can I ask what the budget is or is that rude? Uh, no, it's not rude. I don't know if I'm allowed to say, but it was, 
Yeah, I don't, no, I don't think I'm allowed to say. That's okay. Don't worry, that's fine. Um, <laughs> I'm always just nosy about that. You know me. I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you off screen. I just don't think I can say it publicly. Okay. Fair but, enough. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So we've got a couple of questions here. I've got um, Chris Gross is saying, Craig, what are the three most important experiences the main character should go through in a movie? Wow, that's very specific. Um, well, like Disney, you always want a tragedy. So kill a parent right away. That's always, that's always good. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's very subjective. I don't even know how to answer that. Um, definitely, I think the character should have found something by the end of the script that makes him him or her a little bit different. But I don't think there's one template. You know, I think if you just have your log line, which is your main character what they're trying to accomplish, what's at stake if they don't accomplish it. I think you're pretty good plot wise because you already have your three acts right there. Mm -hmm. um, but I just think the more personal you, you can make their inner journey, especially to yours, like whatever you've experienced in life, because any of us sitting on this, this conference right now can write a script. We all know we can write a script, but it's what your experience of the world is what you have to offer to someone, you know, to a new production, you know, and that's why it's always a great industry is because it just thrives on new people coming in and just kind of taking your experiences. So again, if you're doing a genre like a thriller or an action or a horror or something like that, just put your very, very specific kind of life experience into it. And that's what gets you sold compared to someone else who's just doing like a, like a paint by the numbers, kind of just hitting every beat, just put your personal thing in there. If you have something from your city, if you have something from your town, like I have my town, I live in White Rock, BC right now, there's 17,000 people here. This is a very small town, with very specific experience of the world. We're a border town at the same time. So we always have, you know, drugs and gangs and stuff like that. Or if you have, if you come from a certain, you know, ethnic background, use that. We, you know, we want that more than anything now. You know, it's a great time to have a different perspective on the world as we see as everything feels like it's falling apart. It's a great time for filmmaking because it's just your personal experience and you just need to share that with the world. That's great. I love that answer. And it kind of actually brings up another thing I wanted to ask you. You know, a lot of people think they have to go to L.A. to make it as screenwriters or you're kind of proof that you don't. Can you talk about how you make that work? Well, before that's the thing, you know, everyone gets out of film school or they don't go to film school um, and they just get down there and they have no connections and there's nothing going on. And then a lot of people are still working. A lot of people I know, even from my film class, are working as PAs or, you know, 20 years later because they didn't have connections before they went down. They didn't have a script before they went down. You need to have two to three scripts before you go anywhere to any major metropolis. Um, that being said, you still have to have a connection to get, to, to get, to get down there. You need a connection. And that's ink tip worked for me because even the people who passed on my script, you just, when someone, everyone's get passed on your script. Like I just said, everyone passed on Bandit. You just type back and say, thank you for taking the time. If there's anything else you're looking for in the future, let me know. And I would love to buy you a coffee or a cocktail when I'm down in LA next time. They're like, definitely look me up next time. So you just do that. So it really passes work almost in your advantage. Because if you've been passed on 30 times, now you have 30 contacts there that you could say, well, let's just go have, I'll buy you a coffee or, or, or whatever, whenever you have time, I'm going to be in that area. What area are you in? Um, so you just kind of keep a dialogue going without pushing projects on them and you just become friends. And, you know, the only rule is just don't be a dick, you know, don't be so precious about your stuff. If someone says, well, I don't think this is quite ready, or I don't think you're quite ready, you know, type the back saying, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, there's just not enough people saying thank you in this business, you know, and it's the toughest thing for a first time screenwriter is getting read because at the end of the day of us, like people that are in the industry reading all day, the last thing we want to do is read more. It's like if, if you're a car mechanic at the end of the day and someone says, can you look at my car for free? 
after you've just finished your whole day of work. It's that same thing. So I think if you just approach approach it that way and be very respectful of people, I think, you know, that's how you get in. And so ink tips a good way. Get your rejections. You'll learn more from your rejections than you will from your victories. So just make a connection, even if it's just an assistant, even if you're just calling up an agency, be nice to that assistant because that assistant is training to be that next agent, you know? So I've had just friends just from that, that they're agents like, oh, we're here now, you should come up. So just be nice to everyone, you know? Find common ground with people. You got to kind of be a people person. And I think it's tough as writers because generally we're not people you know, we live in a little bat cave and we write our little things and we think we're little geniuses and the smartest people in the room and stuff. Uh, but you definitely just got to get out there and uh, just interact with the world. That's I said great. interact instead of interact. <laughs> Ever since that interact came out, that payment, I can't say interact properly. <laughs> I think people know what you mean. Um, so I've got <laughs> another question here. Someone wants to know what software you use or what do you recommend? I would just use Final Draft. Um, a lot of people use Celtics because it's free. I don't even know if that's how you say it. I'm just seeing, just seeing it written. Just buy Final Draft. If you're going to invest in, you got to invest in yourself. Just pay whatever it is, 150 bucks, and get Final Draft. It's usually what most people use. Some people use Movie Magic, as as you know. But I think just generally, everyone's just reading PDFs, anyways. But if they see an improperly formatted script right off like if you're doing in word and doing spaces like i used to do and the tab and then it's all off when you print it out you know i think again you just if you want as a job just treat as a job invest in yourself if you want other people to invest in you is kind of just the main thing i would say so just you're gonna have to spend some money at some point so just buy final draft I tend to agree. I mean, there's a couple of good freebies now, Trelby for PCs and Drama Queen for Macs, but the difficulty is exporting them into scheduling and budgeting software, which you can't do. So yeah, Final Draft's definitely the best. Some Canadian television shows use Movie Magic, but now they seem to be transferring to Final Draft as well. So yeah, you know, we don't get a kickback from them or anything, but there's actually a cheap version of Final Draft you can get for your phone, which is 10 bucks. Oh, I need that because I'm always bucks. just making random notes in the note. Yeah. Thing and... It's actually good. There used to be a bad one. And this I just bought the most recent one and it's, it works. How much is it? It's 10 bucks, 10 bucks US. Oh, it is 10 bucks, okay. <laughs> So nice. kind of amazing um because yeah quite the real version is quite expensive now um good and then someone else asked what did they ask oh as a film enthusiast what are your opinions on streaming services basically almost taking over the film and tv industry well it's too because <laughs> yeah. i don't make a lot of money off streaming so i don't really like it that much it's just usually a one-time buyout and then you don't get residual. So they just got sued. Everyone just got sued, which was great. And so writers got paid. Uh, so drinks on me next time I see any guests. But uh, still, it's just, uh, I think you have to see it in a positive way because there's so many streamers. And because there's so much content right now, I think it's an easier time to break in because you can sell, if you're not selling to Netflix, you're selling to Amazon or paramount plus or showtime there's just there's more places and everyone's competing and disney is com- disney while well, they're kind of gods but they're competing still with with netflix um so i think it's a positive i think it's a positive thing um but as writers you do get a little screwed by streamers whereas tv has you know it's on a network you you'll just keep getting paid for it and stuff like that but uh so, yeah. So if a streamer is watching this, I like you very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, Secret Obsession did really well, right? And it was interesting to watch that because a lot of times Netflix doesn't tell people how movies did, but they seemed really invested in in reporting the success of Secret Obsession. Yeah, yeah. No, it was good. It was good. We had we had a lot of views, which was nice. Um, but again, uh, even though they got 40 million uh, views in that 28 days, I still didn't make one cent off of that. Oh, that's <laughs> yeah. if, it's, if it was in a theater or if it was on you know video on demand i would make money from that but you don't necessarily do that on streamers not specifically netflix they're not the only one it's that's it's every streamer <laughs> you know, they're just Let's kind hope of it made you more saleable to everybody else yeah yeah exactly everything's an experience everything's material mm-hmm. everything's a grudge 
<laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, all right. So um, Miroslava Garcia asks, which websites do you find the most beneficial beneficial to start being involved in the film industry? Well, again, Ink Tip was great and Movie Bites was great. Uh, back in the day, there Francis Ford Coppola had one that was called Zoetrope. That was really good. Um, any of those peer sites are good. Um, Blacklist is good for connecting with other writers. And Coverfly, I think, is pretty decent. But again, at, at the same time, those they're trying to get your money at the same time. So they're like, unlock more reviews and, and, and all stuff like that. So I don't know. Kat, again, you would know more about this stuff than me. I'm not really going on websites but i know no, i mean you've named my favorites actually too so that's really yeah. good um yeah it's interesting i mean it's it's more like that now but it's still the face-to-face -face stuff that really does matter in the end of the relationships you build yeah call up an agency and ask for a junior agent make sure you have two or three scripts and you know that's actually the other thing i would say know your brand know if you're a thriller writer you're a thriller writer don't be Everyone's always afraid, oh, they're going to pigeonhole me as this and this and this. You want them to pigeonhole you. You want them to get, oh, that's the guy in horror that's going to do a whole bunch of, there'll be a big body count, or it'll be an elevated horror, and, or in a thriller, it's going to be like a weird psychological. Oh, that's the psychological person. So find your niche early, and that's use that as your calling card. So, because I think whenever anyone contacts me randomly through Instagram or, or where, wherever, I'll say, well, what do you, what do you write? Well, I like horror, thriller, comedy, uh, Westerns. I also really like musicals, but really sci-fi and adventure. And so <laughs> I don't know what that person, I don't know how to sell that person anyway. Yeah. So just lock into kind of one thing and make that your brand. You're a brand, you know, it's, it's, it's not art business. It's show business. You know, at the end of the day, you're selling something you're selling a product i think that in the beginning was always the hardest thing especially coming from a punk rock and and metal back background about selling out and stuff it's just it's it's a job at the end of the day it's a job and you're working at a job and you're selling something every one of your favorite artists in music sold something you know i think that was a big obstacle to get over for me is just oh you're selling out you're doing this Oh, you're, you're buying in, you're, you know, you're selling a product, you're selling, you're selling your memories and, and, and your soul and your heart and stuff like that. So that's just what, that's just what it is. You know, just I love that, Craig. get I think over yourself, time. get over yourself. That's, I still haven't gotten over myself. I would <laughs> say keep trying, keep trying, Craig. The first time that you and I had a conversation about this, about branding yourself and choosing your niche, I asked you, what's your brand? And you said. Uh, popcorn with an edge. No, you said my brand is murder. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I was like, yeah. That's true. It's changed. That. Yeah, it's changed a little bit. Yeah, of course it was my well, brand. I mean, Very your brand it's not just about, uh, not really about murder in the same way. But, you know, I love that though. The simplicity of being able yeah. to say that. And that's and why I like it. If you go to my Instagram, I'm like, for a long time, and I still don't like really smile in photos because I'm like selling a brand of. I do true crime. Yeah. <laughs> that was like, I meet you in real life and, you know, you're just smiling all the time and laughing and yeah. you know, like crying on the inside, of course. Oh, but, no. Uh, yeah, no, at that time, yeah, murder was my brand. Uh, now it, my brand is popcorn with an edge. Oh, okay. So I've got a couple more questions here. Uh, Yana Ferrance wants to know, uh, although you do feature films primarily, um, they were wondering if you also have tips for someone wanting to go to screenwriting for television or limited series. Yeah, that, and I think that's the toughest one to get into because that's one of those ones where you kind of need a little bit of an L.A. connection because uh, a lot of the writers, there's writer rooms here The you know, Dennis Heaton's here and he's, he's our God. And uh, but most of the writing rooms are in L.A., and it's very much for me, I never got into it because it felt like a job because like you're showing up at 10 a.m. and you're leaving at 7 p.m. at night. Mm -hmm. and it's like Chris Rock says, I didn't get into show business to work. And I was like, I don't, I don't want that job. I don't want to wear a tie. Not that they wear ties, but uh, <laughs> so really with that, you want to get in as like a writer's assistant. And if you're in Vancouver here, 
I'm sure Kat could hook you up. <laughs> I like pushing a lot to you. Thanks a lot, Beck, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Contact Kat, yeah, Kat immediately after. Um, you kind of, yeah, you just want to work your way into the room as a writer's assistant, as an office uh, PA. If you're, I think just PAs in general, if you want to work on set and then work your way up to assistant director and stuff, do that. But if you want to do producing and like kind of the inside stuff, I would just get like the office set job and then just work your way up through there because you're going to be in the same room as the producer hearing everything and then becoming their number one man or, or woman um so that's what i would do i would be a pa if i went back and wanted to do it i would just be a pa in an office uh to start up i think that's great advice and i always took in my class about stepping stone jobs and office pa is one of the best ones because you're there it's not like being a pa on set where you're you know guiding traffic and stuff um, but you're seeing the producers, you're seeing the writing room assistants, you can position yourself to get yeah. the next job up. Um, and so again, you're just being friendly the whole time, you know, and then that it's just always that fine line of being friendly, but not pushy at the same time, you know, just be a decent, decent person, ask people what they're into and see if you have a common ground on like a sports team or a movie, you're always going to have a, like a common ground on some movie. You know, if you ask someone their top three favorite movies, they're usually a little bit different Then you go, Oh, I like that third one. And then talk about that third one and then just build a relationship off your commonalities. That's great. Oh, I've got a question here that I think you're going to like. This is from Zimu Li. Uh, Zimu says, hello, I'm a filmmaker from China. I know there are some stereotypes about Chinese films, but still want to ask, is there any potential market for our works in terms of genre and stories? Well, that's, what's great about, just any international thing, especially China, because I worked in China uh, for Jackie Chan for a while. And that's why, because China is just like, if a movie flops here and there's a bit of an action, it can go to China. I think China, I don't know. I don't know. They're, they're either one or two for global box office and it changes all the time. Um, so, you know, a punch feels the same in every language, which is just the key to, to these great, uh, Chinese movies, you know, mainland China's great, Hong Kong's great, Taiwan's great. I know they're all three different types of things, but mainland China, there's so much opportunity. You just have to know the rules of playing the game in China. I love China. I lived in Shanghai. I would go back anytime. Um, that's great. Yeah, I just I just think China's still the future. I think there's a big future in Russia as well. Uh, there's uh, a big opportunity in India uh, right now, and even in our film, just I didn't even know it was playing. Our film's in Saudi Arabia right now. I was like, how is like this a radar film? And there's like some nudity. <laughs> I don't know how they got it there, but that's turning into be a, a new kind of market. So China's a great, you know. Look at that, yeah. everything, everywhere, all at once. I think that was the best. I know it's still an American movie, but yeah. that was the best movie of the year. Top Gun was great, but that movie was the best. I love uh, it. And in Canada, we have an international co-production treaty with China, so we can make films with China, which are, you know, partly, yeah. Canadian, partly Chinese. I'd love to see more of that. Yeah. Canada and China's China's a big thing. So it's great to be Chinese. So then you have that kind of tax credit from that area. And so it's great if you have, if you're Chinese and you have your mainland China, it's it's great to do an action movie or do a nice love story. I would stay away from any story that has a Caucasian guy coming into China with the with the female lead. Uh, just in general, the government hates that there. And I think the audiences are pretty tired of that there. You know, it's almost like a white savior kind of thing, which yeah. is kind of. Uh, so I would just tell again what your personal story is of China and try to think of it on a global scale, you know. Um, so yeah, I've sold I've sold lots of action scripts that are uh American and uh Chinese. So it's fantastic. It's uh oh, okay. So JC has a question. Uh what advice would you give people who are about to break into the industry, like specific do's and don'ts? Oh, I was just talking about this the other day. I would say if you ever send out a query that says this is a movie unlike any movie you've ever seen, that's a red flag that you're new to the industry. You don't know what you're talking about. And I, I, and I know because I did it as well. And then now I see it. And I'm like, oh, that's OK. This is they've written one script because 
everything's based on something, you know, you're like, it's not like, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a love story you've never seen. So it's, it's what you've seen a love story. It's your take on the story. That doesn't mean that it's unlike anything you've seen. You could say it's slightly different, but that's always the major red flag. Uh, so never say that ever in your life. Just if you're having your query right now, just, just highlight delete That is the worst. Um, the other one is just, just don't be a dick and don't be pushy at the same time. Uh, you know, we're getting pitched every day of our lives. I, I, I could go into my Instagram right now and someone telling me how they have a great idea for a movie. You just need to make friends with people first and respect boundaries. Uh, so if you're, if someone invites you to a film party, don't go around that party pitching anything for any reason. People just want to see that you can hang out and be cool and not be that guy that's, or girl that's in the ear, just doing this the whole time. Um, that's, it's just, it's all relationship building. That's the best advice I could ever give anyone. And then the third is don't think your idea is the best just because you thought of it. And that's that idea of just escaping your ego of, Oh no, I'm, I'm brilliant. I'm amazing. Of course you're brilliant and amazing. But this is a collaborative process. It's not, you're not doing a painting by yourself in a room. You're working with a department of a hundred people or even on an indie, it's still, there's still 10 people, you know, we're not the best. We like to think we're the best. We like to think we're the smartest. If you, you know, if, if you, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room, first of all, but you just have to let go of that idea of, I thought of it. So it's the best. That's that's the hardest thing. That's the hardest thing to get over. And you'll struggle with that for the rest of your life because I do it as well. <laughs> <laughs> that's really good. All right. So we've got a couple more questions. Um, Chris Gross wants to know, what is your advice for writing a great antagonist? Uh, make them better than your hero. Make them smarter than your hero. Uh, make them, you know, they have, they think they're the hero of their own story. You know, just they have a very specific, I'm the hero of my own story. And I'm going to do this, this, and this to get it. But for them, the problem is, is your hero, like the, your protagonist is the opposite. So he's trying to accomplish the same, th like his own thing. And it's always against whatever your antagonist is trying to do. So just because actors will always sign on for a villain before a hero every time. Villain gets the speeches, the villain gets, you know, I think Black Panther's a really good example of just a villain trying to do something better for his people. You know, make it an actual noble cause where for a second you can see, I see where they're coming from. I see what they're trying to accomplish. They're trying to accomplish something that's for a greater good, but that opposes whatever your hero is trying to do. Because, you know, on any side of war, you know, it's just all viewpoint. You know, someone's terrorist is another person's hero. So just look at it that way. So a villain, the villain has to be better written than I think your hero does for me. Nice. All right. So I'm going to bring it back to Bandit because we've got a couple of Bandit related questions. So first of all, Steve McGowan wants to know, was it hard or easy to get the rights to songs? For example, that kick-ass soundtrack to Bandit. <laughs> yeah that was that that was one of the harder things because usually by the time you get into post-production there's no money left for music whatsoever and ours is set in the 80s so you need 80s related music and stuff like that and then originally when i started it, it was 2015 and there was no 80s movies out there was nothing and then i think stranger things kind of hit somewhere in 2015 somewhere in there and I was like, ah, oh, fuck, this is going to kill us for music. And like, because then they just started using all the 80s thing. And then everyone started doing 80s as we're like, still just like raising money. And I was just like, just going to look like we're copying everyone. Like even Wonder Woman was like 84. I was like, oh, just because once, <laughs> once people know, even if it's an obscure song, once they know it's money, then it's just, it just keeps skyrocketing. So there were songs we wanted for Bandit from the time that were just like, you know, it's a hundred thousand dollars for you know, or it's two fifty for an ACDC song, two hundred fifty thousand dollars for an ACDC song. You know, so then we kind of just recalibrated and said, what if we just focus? It's a Canadian movie. Why don't we just make our main songs 
like the Canadian stars that we grew up with. And so we have like Troopers Raise a Little Hell. And, you know, we have Burton Cummings, My Own Way to Rock. And we have, you know, all these other great Doug and the Slugs song, you know, making it work and, and stuff like that. And then we also got Boy George, which is good. And he was cool because we didn't know. We thought he would be like super expensive, but we kind of told him what we're trying to do with the movie. And we're, we're talking about uh, gender and cross-dressing and all that stuff at the time. And I just wrote him this big letter. And then he's just like, yeah, yeah, of course you can use my song and I'll write a new song for you if you want. On top wow. of that. I, he was just the sweetest person ever. Of course we ran out of money, so we couldn't pay him to write a new song, but uh, we got it. We got Karma Chameleon and he was so sweet about it. Um, and then, uh, yeah. And then we got Skinner's Freebird, which was kind of cool. And then just a whole bunch of little Canadian artists that people didn't necessarily know that were Canadian. So it was the ultimate Canadian movie. I would never suggest anyone write a Canadian movie again. But, uh, <laughs> we tried it and it, it worked. But uh, yeah. I love it that you wrote a Canadian movie with Canadian music and it ended up having to make it in the States. It's like the opposite yeah. of what you usually. And the director's Canadian and the, <laughs> uh, the big producer's Canadian. And we just had to take it all into Southern Georgia. That's hilarious. Um, I've got another question from someone who's anonymous to say, do you think you've set a high bar for yourself after screenwriting Bandit that became a successful film? That sounds like it's one of my friends. <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee you that's like my sister. <laughs> <laughs> the question was, have you set a high bar for yourself? Are they, do no. they think you're going to get swell headed or like, what are they, what are they implying? My head's already like physically <laughs> huge. It actually looks like one of these masks on my wall. Um, no, it's just everything. It doesn't matter whatever you do. Someone's always going to shit on it. Someone's always going to say, it sucks. It's terrible. You're a terrible person. You should be shot for doing this. Oh. And they, they, they do. I get messages all the time. Oh, I'm <laughs> so sorry to hear that. It would be too high up there, you know? Like when I remember seeing on Rotten Tomatoes that at one point we were higher than Fight Club. And Fight Club is my favorite movie. I'm like, what? Is there someone who said Fight Club wasn't a good movie? And so it's just like even the Godfathers. I don't even think the Godfathers hundred percent on there. I'm like, what is your problem with the Godfather? You know, everyone's just always going to try to knock you down. And especially as a new screenwriter, everyone wants to knock you down. That's the biggest. Sorry, going back. That's the biggest hurdle because they'll tell you, especially if you're from outside of LA. They'll say, well, you go to LA, everyone has a screenplay. The bartender has a screenplay. The bouncer has a screenplay. And it's true, but it doesn't mean it's a good screenplay. It's just anyone can write anything on a page. And there's whatever, there's a million scripts registered at the Writers Guild. It just doesn't matter. It's your personal experience that you've brought into that that will change it for everyone. And it happens all the time. And it's an industry that thrives on new and younger talent. So that's what keeps the industry going is new ideas and younger people coming in and, you know, it's just like the Godfather, you know, you take out, take out the old guy. Nice. All right. Now I've got another one. Petra wants to know how important is your work-life balance? <laughs> is my work-life balance? Oh, work -life oh, I see. Balance. I see. I see. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, at the end of the day, we are making movies, but they are just kind of movies. We're not we're not necessarily changing the world in a way that say a teacher like you would, you know, it's just, I think you just have to balance that of work for a certain amount of time in the day, do it every day. I work from 9 AM to 12 30 PM. And then the rest of my day is free to hang out with my family and do whatever. So I think, yeah, it's, that's the toughest thing to do. I think if you're working 10 hours a day on, on screen, right? I think you'll just kill yourself. <laughs> like, like not physically, like just emotionally, you'll just burn out. So just, you know, focus on whatever time, if you're a night writer, if you work from 10 to 1am, do that, but just do it kind of every day, set a page count. You know, uh, if you can't write 20 pages, write 10 pages. If you can't write 10 pages, write five, can't write five, write two, you know, even one page, you can't edit a blank page, so just get that one page done and make sure you do it every day. If you did, uh, you know, 10 pages a day for 10 days, you have a script. That's it. And that's a first draft. And that's a first draft no one's going to read. So I don't know. I don't work long. I don't believe in uh, over glamorizing hard work. 
and working yourself so hard that by the end of the day, you get home, you don't have time to pursue, pursue your dream. Um, I think that's kind of pushed on us just by society in general, you know, just it's that idea just work smarter, more efficiently and just a, a little bit. I really like that consistency aspect. Like I think a lot of people want to want to be writers, but you know, they they wish the writing would go and do its own thing <laughs> rather than them having to do it. I love it's it that, that you're prolific because you write every day. Well, it's that idea of I think whatever art you're doing is you're just sitting around waiting for inspiration. And it's just inspiration has to find you working. You know, the tap needs to be running before it's like pouring, you know. Um, so and that's the problem. People get writer's block and writer's block is all just this fear of failure of if I complete, if I don't complete it, I never fail. But if I complete it, then, oh, people can judge it. And then I, then I fail as well. Just complete it again. No one has to read that first draft just fucking write that first draft. It's Nike. Just do it, get it done, put it away and come back to it. No one's going to see it except for you. You know, just don't be, I, th- I think writers just judge themselves too much as they're doing work on the page and you don't have to figure it all out in the first draft. If you get stuck on a section, just write, come back to this later. If you get stuck on a line of dialogue, right? Joke to come later. You know, if you're stuck on a scene or there's a scene you don't want to write after, jump ahead to the scene that you do want to write, you know, whatever you have to do to get it done, just get it done because our currency is a script. It's not an idea. It's not a pitch. It's not a pitch deck. It's a finished script. That's your currency. If you don't have that, you don't have anything. I love that you said that. You know, I saw an ad the other day. Someone was advertising, well, I have everything. I've got the the, the idea and the pitch and the everything. Like we've been greenlit. All I need is a script. And I was like, you liar. Because <laughs> 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 without the script, you have nothing. There's no way he had any kind of a green light without it. Really I'm sure he probably contacted me with the same information. <laughs> <laughs> um so I've got a follow-up kind of question, which is, you know, when the screenplay changes during filming, how do you not get frustrated about that? Well, again, it's that that's ego thing is mm-hmm. if you want to just do art, that's just you just do a painting. Um, even Michelangelo was commissioned and they gave him tips. Someone's like, say, well, maybe you should put a little more red on that. <laughs> no matter what, it's just, it's a collaborative thing. You got a lot of people on that set. You have a lot of other egos, a lot of other people that can't set aside their egos. Um, I first started out like being very sensitive to it. Uh, I think I even got in like a fist fight with a producer. Or something. You did not. And we're still friends. And we're still friends. Uh, I would advise <laughs> no one to do that. Um, yeah, no, that's just the toughest part. But, you know, if you have, I think you just have to give other people some faith, have some faith in your director, have some faith in your actors. It's not just necessarily people putting in their two cents just to put in their two cents. They have ideas. Everyone has ideas. Um, with band, it was really good. We did tons of improv on set and then, you know, you just got to have fun with it. You know, like even on set, I, we would just like dare the actors to do something. When you walk in the scene, just, just be shirtless. Like even in bandit, there's a scene where he's just selling ice cream. And he's got this vest on this rainbow vest. That's like this half top. And I said, you got to do the next take, like shirtless under that thing. And then it just became a visual gag of him <laughs> just doing this and then sucking in his stomach to try to get his soul and then sticking it up. When he didn't, you know. And that all came from the actor. It wasn't me. It was just, you know, it was just people just daring and just giving suggestions. You know, it's a collaborative process. Uh, just like anything. You got to be a team player. Now, having said that, one of the reasons you get to be around and be on set is that you've started producing your own work uh, or co-producing it. Is that yeah. is 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 that because you want more of that? Well, I want to do that just because you have a little more creative control and stuff like that. But again, that all depends on your director because most directors don't want a writer on set because it essentially becomes the director's film. You know, once you sell your script, it's like selling your car. If someone else drives it off the cliff, it's not your fault. But if you get a good director, um, you know, they'll want you into the collaborative process. And that's what it was with Bandit. And that's why it's like my only good movie is just because it was like a team effort and no one was precious about certain words and thinking you're a genius just because you came up with this, you know, just go into everything that the best idea in the room wins, not your idea, the best idea. 
And so always just sit back, especially when you're going to get notes, you're going to get 10 pages of notes anytime you turn a draft in, or at least five pages of notes. You just got to sit back, don't react right away, give it 24 hours. And then what I do is I just, I print them out and then I start doing the notes and I take a big black Sharpie and I just cross out their note after I've done it. And it just makes me feel like a teacher at school that, okay, I've conquered your note. This is, but you know. It's just little survival techniques. You know, if you're in the jungle, this is what you have to do to survive. I love that. Well, we've got a a funny question slash compliment from Steve McGowan, who says, if I have an idea from a story and see it as a novel versus a screenplay, and find myself conflicted, would you suggest just going ahead and aiming to write a novel and then later adapt it into a screenplay? Or should I stick to formulating it as a script? And then he also says, how often does Craig get mistaken for Ryan Gosling, you handsome devil? (laughs) (laughs) he's been trying to set up a meeting with me for like three months oh (laughs) he's trying again so what do you think he's like i'll get you now (laughs) Um, yeah yeah no don't go go write the novel for sure yeah Yeah, just get it just get it done no one has to see it uh and then we can adapt it to a, a screenplay at some point and by me, I mean you, Steve, not. not <laughs> yes, but uh, no, no, definitely, definitely write the novel. Everyone's looking for novels. Um, you know, you could be more in depth with them. And just when you're writing your novel, Steve, just make sure you kind of outline it ahead of time. Because I find in the same way scripts work is everyone has that idea for the first scene. You know, some people have an idea for the last scene. And then there's that middle section where it's just like death. And you just look at this blank and you're like, oh. I didn't plot this out properly. So just start with an outline, you know, with, you know, your beginning, middle, end, and make it always harder for your main character to achieve whatever he's doing. It's back to the future, right? He's got to get back to the future, make it harder each time until he can't do it. Love that. Well, I've got one one question. I'm going to quickly answer some. A couple of people have asked about protecting their scripts before they put them into contests. I'm going to say you can register with the Writers Guild of America or the American Copyright Office, but not with Canadian. Uh, the Canadian Copyright Office doesn't even want your script, and the Writers Guild doesn't register scripts anymore here. But I have heard you, Craig Gwentman, say before that if you're going to make it as a screenwriter, you just have to show people your work. I'm assuming you still feel the same way. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. You can register with the library. Congress is the other one. Uh, the mailing to yourself doesn't work. It's not real. Okay. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, you want everyone to read your script. You just have to get it out there. Are they going to steal your script? Probably not. Realistically, will they steal some ideas from it? Probably. Um, but that's just kind of that thing you have to get as a first time writer is you just think your idea is the best because you came up with it, you know, for the most part, they're not going to steal your script. I've had definitely had ideas ripped off, but there's writers who sue and there's writers who work. You know, it's just kind of part of the industry because even if someone hates your entire script, they'll like that one scene. And then they're in a meeting with their boss and they say, oh, what about a movie about this? And then it's like this. And then you're sitting there in the theater. Go, oh, I remember writing this entire sequence. It's just, it's just a part of it. It's heartbreaking, but I don't know. You could win a you could win a million dollars off of it, sure, but you'll never work again. It's true. All right, so um, we should stop wrapping up, but because we're done really with time, and there's a couple of questions we didn't get to, but they were similar to other things that were asked, and uh, we can't, I'm afraid, take up your entire evening, although we would love to. Um, but thank you so much, Craig, for coming, and thank you for everyone for the fantastic questions. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. I'll come scare your class on a later date. Please do. I always love it when you come, as you know, and uh, and we will continue to invite you as long as you'll stand it. Um, but in the meantime, you know, it's been really nice opening this up a little bit to some of our grads, but also some people who may be thinking about coming to film school yeah. or just becoming screenwriters. So check out, if you're with Format, check out Pat's <laughs> book. Yeah. This one right Thank here. You for pitching that for me, so That's I don't have to. Do that. And okay. also read uh, the Screenwriter's Bible uh, yeah. is really good too. Screenwriter's Bible is really good. But this is really, this is really hands on. This is quick. It's a nice read. It's a nice thin read, and it's actually done in the format, and it's teaching you as it goes. So I would do that. Screenwriter's Bible, uh, Save the Cats, always good. Skip Robert McKee, uh, 
skip Sid Field because it's outdated. Just read uh, read those three; it'd be good. Excellent. Yeah, I completely agree. Ah, oh, very uh, very nice to see you, Craig. Thank you so much. Thanks so for having me. family. All right, we'll see you later. Take care. Bye.